Welcome back to Invisible Machines, a podcast produced in partnership with UX Magazine and OneReach.ai, uh, where we talk about ideas from our book, Age of Invisible Machines. Uh, Rob, today's uh, episode is like a great big uh, birthday present for oh you. We're God. speaking with uh, <laughs> with Dr. Jim Weber, I was who's the chief this. scientist at Neo4j. Uh I'll let you go with this because you had so much fun. Uh, GraphDB uh, is is a term that that Neo4j popularized, uh, and it's it's a huge passion of yours. And I think by association, it's become something that's very exciting to me as well. So yeah, I mean, I yeah, what were you excited? I about? really think the convergence of graph and LLMs is like gonna. I mean, convergence in general, right? With mm -hmm. but in particular, graph and LLMs is 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 just going to be a massive massive next leap and. Um, so to talk to the guys that, you know, basically created graph as a concept and cipher as language, um, and you know, it, it's as if they designed it for this moment. Uh, I think it's similar to one reach and, you know, you kind of look at like how this moment of LLMs come and, and our product is, it, it, it was like, you know, designed for this moment in their case. It fits so well uh, with LLMs. It it's such a perfect pairing, and and that you know that wasn't was far less intentional on their part. But it, who who cares? That's I think that's how most things are invented. <laughs> and as we yeah. as we've talked to many inventors in our podcast here and discovered that you know a lot of these things are you know the whole peanut butter in your chocolate thing, um, but. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't wait to dig in and, and explore some of that stuff in this episode. So like let's yeah, let's let's get into it. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. Dr. Jim Weber. All right, Jim, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Uh, we're really excited to have the opportunity to talk to you. We are we are big fans yeah. of Graph D V. Um, but we have noticed that a lot of times when we try and share our enthusiasm with people who are not, uh, you know, understanding the, the breadth of GraphDB, they come back to us and say, well, I could just do that with a regular database. Like, why, why would I use GraphDB, um, which really slows our momentum. So we were hoping maybe you could give an answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I can try, right? I've only, I've only been answering that question for about 15 years now. <laughs> right? Uh, uh, I should be really good at it at this point. So, I, I'm, I, yeah, I hope my boss isn't listening to this, but all the databases are amazing. Love them, right? It's, uh, it's probably outside of operating system. It's probably the nerdiest thing you can do in the computing yeah. stack, right? So they're a really attractive thing for folks to work in. I think what we're you know, realizing, at least you know, uh, a lot of folks are realizing, the open-minded part of the community are realizing, is that data doesn't come in a kind of one shape or size anymore, right? You've got you know small bits of data that are irregular, and actually sometimes you've got really large data that's really well-structured, and actually you, you tend to use different machinery to kind of process and query and, uh, and, 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 and store that, that kind of data. And a graph sits in a really interesting space, right? So a graph or a network, uh, as you might call it. Um, we we are uh, interested in highly associative structures or highly connected structures. Um, you know, that might be a telephone network or just outside here, the, the tube network in London. It might be some genomics problem. It might be a logistics problem. But we're really interested in this. You know, we build, we build those high fidelity models from this very simple structure of node or you know, a vertex if you're mathsy, but node if you're a human connected by relationships or edges, if you're mathsy, to other nodes. It's a really lovely model, right? It's very simple. It's the kind of thing you'd sketch on a whiteboard if you were designing a system. And of course, I think at this point, some folks would say, well, you know, Josh, Rob, Jim, I can store this in Postgres. And, and you're quite right, you can. But I think what, what happens when you store it in Postgres is that you take the nice model that you had on the whiteboard and you decompose it into some relational schema, which add some kind of impedance mismatch between your intent and actually what you store in the database. Now, actually, if you're, if you're doing something good like Postgres, you've probably got a, an entity relationship diagram where you've got your design of your, your database, and that is itself a graph. But then what happens is that we kind of dismantle that ERD and we turn it into a bunch of tables and then we normalize. And then, of course, the really good folks know how to denormalize for performance and uh. so on. And then it ends up with your and your data not looking a lot like your domain model. So there's a bit of a disconnect there. That's one 
one issue that I think graphs solve. And the other issue is, is actually performance. So, you know, in the early days of Neo4j, Neo4j didn't come from a deliberate project to build a database, actually. Uh, I don't think so many people know this, but uh, modern graph databases were born out of frustration. So my boss at Neo4j, the CEO, he was working in an enterprise content management company. And of course, they had a database, the database. Because back in the day, every database <laughs> yeah. was the database, right? And you can imagine which flavor. It, it was one of the three flavors of relational, of course, because that, yeah. that's what we had back in the day. And enterprise content management turns out to be quite interconnected problems. You've got things like you know, sophisticated permissions that you have to express over a range of assets, which are accessible or owned by different companies and so on and so forth. So you've got a bunch of intersecting graphs here. And the observation was that it was really hard to write those kind of queries in SQL. Nothing, nothing to do with the database at that point, but the fact that the SQL queries were doing kind of recursive joins and all kinds of funky stuff to figure out path expressions are really hard. And so one of the engineers on that team, may even have been my boss, that, that bit's lost to history, kind of said, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we had an API over the database where we could write this in terms of A connects to B connects to C kind of things. And this is where tragedy strikes because it got popular. So people like the ability to write graph expressions because it made reasoning about this complex interconnected domain easily. So they started to write more complicated graph expressions. And those more complicated graph expressions got translated into an underlying SQL engine and crushed it. And that's because in SQL, we know SQL is brilliant until you join. And eventually you start, uh -huh. as you add more and more joins, typically a SQL database will go more slowly. And at right. four, five, six, ten joins deep. Joins, cursors, start, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the, the machinery yep. starts to kind of grind down. In fact, I, 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 I suspect what was happening there is that the SQL database was working fine. It, you know, it had run out of RAM because you were doing Cartesian products of sets. It was using uh -huh. the operating system to spill over into virtual memory. Perfect, right? This is how the system's supposed to work. But of course, virtual memory is disk masquerading as RAM. And back in the 2000s, disks were not fast. So I think right. what you get with graph is two things. You get a really humane, pleasant data model, and it works really fast for modern, variably structured data. And since you right. know that early you know, catastrophe that led to Neo4j, other folks have picked up the pattern and kind of run with it. Yeah, and you had these really insane things like materialized views just just to handle the fact that it, these things were so heavy and slow, and then that had all this complexity attached to it because now you had duplicate data and when do you go back to the query and run it again? And uh, just like this mess of caching. Yeah, it, it is a mess. And I think what I find is, you know, I, I sort of call it an over, an over emphasis on declarative data and an, a complete miss on relationship data. Um, yeah. And saying like, it's great to have a, a list or a database full of contacts of customers but to have no idea how these customers are related to each other um and and to know like you know line one and line two in the database may be husband and wife <laughs> like we have no idea they may be best friends it it matters in a lot of cases and and that's just that's just one of a thousand different ways they could be related to each other and yeah. the idea that you're gonna assess this out and build the schema even to a developer that now can't build code without understanding the schema that looks like the streets of you know rome you know you're like whoa how do i get well this is a dead end that you know like you got to understand the whole schema structure just just to just to update a piece of data and understand the implications of it and, and so these these met you know monoliths end up in this don't touch it mode like yeah, yeah. <laughs> just don't update it don't touch it because you know we can't change the schemas yeah, and then, that's a worry right people have that worry about schema migrations because we know from experience that, that they're painful right right it's it's a it's a real kind of terrifying moment when you have to do right. one of those in your production system and i always tell people you don't have to it's not one or the other you don't have to get rid of your 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 favorite database they work well together. You know, if that's where your data is and you want to point at it from the graph and, and you want to have declarative data there as well, you can do that. And, yeah. and, and they, and they work like, like in an awesome way together. And, but you know, I'm a big fan of that relation. I think 
I think all the music is in the relationships. Um, and declarative data to me is boring. <laughs> I'll be honest. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, I, I think all data is pretty exciting, and I, and I do love <laughs> genuinely all, all kinds of you know systems. And but, but I think yeah. you're, you're right that you know, you, the, you know at some point most most data will be graph. And I'm confident to say that because I think the graph data, the graph data model is so useful. It's so broadly horizontally useful that I think uh -huh. graph data will be the kind of standard database for the next 30 years, as relational has been for the previous 30 or 40 years, right? They're both yeah. very general purpose models. I think I think graph has you know, the, the, the benefits of performance and flexibility. I mean, you talk about husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, boyfriend, whatever it happens to be, it's really hard to express that in a relational schema, yeah. right? Whereas in a graph, I've got two people, I can put a relationship between them and call that relationship anything I want. And in fact, so I can put many relationships between them. Yes. In, in direct and call those anything I want. Yes. And that's damnably hard work in a relational database, right? Because there are any wait, do I need a new join table or do I need a new kind of foreign key constraint there to express right. every permutation? You were my boyfriend, now you're my husband, now you're my ex husband. You, right. you, it's, it's really annoyingly tricky. Whereas with a graph, that's just another link. And it's so Absolutely. it's so just not exceptional. It's just so normal to do that in a graph that you yeah. almost forget how powerful that is, right? To be able to I describe know. your model in high fidelity without the technology yep. getting in your way. Yeah. And you just threw out that, you know, I kind of glossed over the fact that a temporal graph, like that idea of like time and going back in time and seeing relationships as they existed because relationships are far more transient typically than declarative data and understanding the relationships with how declarative data changes and how that changes relationships so your best friend becomes just another acquaintance after your address information changes because you move to a different city and being able to go back in time and connect these things and and look at it it's, I, I think of it as the rings of a tree, you know, how you study climate by looking at the rings of the tree, going backwards, and there's so much you can understand about the environment just by studying the data points in each ring. And then you look at a temporal graph where you can go backwards in time and see what relationships were and what the state of things were at one time and then how they change over time and how that begins to unlock, just like in the rings of a tree, we can now forecast and run simulations yeah. and and say well what if we made changes in the future how could we how would this change the relationships and it's just like so so, so i'm obviously a super nerd on this and i <laughs> i just love it and then i add this uh, and i got to keep geeking out here i'm just going to go <laughs> one more step and say now you at make this data you add like a confidence score to this data right so now we're like all right I can go back in time and I can have multiple pieces of data on address, but I can have confidence scores attached to it. Yep. And those could be determined by time, just how long ago I collected that declarative data. And, and then I can trigger things like reconfirming with somebody their address just based on a low confidence score. And yep. so now we've got time and confidence and relationship and you know, now we got a human brain, <laughs> you know, wow. or at least we Both got right. something somewhat similar to how how our human bit brain relates to information. And our brain is so much about relationships, like just, and that's where I wanted to take you was like, now we get into transfer, right? The ability to transfer, you know, knowledge from one use case to other use cases because we have this full map. Um, I, I don't know if that's something, you know, that you guys talk much about but but it, these, it is, you right? know so the, the cipher language is like patterns you know they're not just it, it they're is. not and queries we we, we we so yes that's absolutely right and, and so, again so, something i think a lot of folks don't know is that cipher cipher came about kind of by a happenstance we had a, a previous query language it's called gremlin which we open sourced and that went to the ultimately went to the apache uh, community and, and Gremlin was fine, but it was effectively a clone of a Java API that we had in the low levels of the product, trying to encourage people you know, not to be concerned by Java and they could write it in this kind of string. But because of that, it's imperative, right? It was like programming. It wasn't like thinking. It wasn't about expressing needs. It was about telling a system what to do. And it turned out that 
that's not a nice way to think about databases in the general case. I mean, even SQL kind of got that partially right. You know, SQL is like, tell me what to find and I'll figure out right. the best way how to. And Cypher's very like that. And the way it came about, would you believe that in the engineering team at Neo4j, when we were little, I don't know, there's maybe <laughs> 20, 15, 20 people in the whole of Neo4j at that point. It's, you know, <laughs> we're in some tiny little office in Southern, we took away in Southern Sweden somewhere. And it's, you know, there's no Versus way. Versus the there's... baby Huey you are today. <laughs> well, you know, right? I mean, we're not a bit bigger today, you know. So it's, it's funny now, like I don't know everybody. Uh, whereas like, you know, 13 yeah. years ago, I knew everybody their families, their pets, their kids, everything. But back in that time, we found that we needed a way to share graphs with each other. And would you believe that the thing, the tool we really liked was Microsoft Visio. And we liked Microsoft Visio because you could draw circles and then you can connect them with an arrow. And the wonderful thing is you could write in the arrow. And the conversation <laughs> in the engineering tie, uh, the team at the time was, well, wouldn't it be nice if the query language looked like this? Which sounds ridiculous, right? I mean, right. Query, did you want query language? But then some folks were like, well, actually, this could be ASCII artable. And that's the genesis of these, these path patterns that you see, right? So it was the idea that we could sketch both data and patterns in Microsoft Visio and then do the same in ASCII art, which came to prevalence. And actually, I was at Sig Sigmod last week, the big academic conference on, on data technology over, over in Seattle. And it was so heartening to see so many of these patterns written down on all of the slides by these excellent researchers and academics. I've, I reflected on, you know, that crazy conversation in Southern Sweden suddenly has really yes. left its boot print firmly on the industry because now everyone describes paths and patterns in the same way that we do with that Microsoft Visio-like syntax. I'm also hoping Microsoft aren't listening in now because I don't want to get sued for some kind of IP <laughs> violation. <laughs> it would really derail us. <laughs> One um, one thing that's super fun about this for me is you simplified querying these complex relational queries, which are like joins. And and it's not just about the complexity of the query. It's the fact that you can't write the query without understanding the schema intimately, right? It's yeah. Yeah. It goes well beyond just being an expert at joining and writing efficient queries, right? Which is in itself extremely, extremely difficult. But you also have to be intimate with the schema um, behind it and you have to keep up with all of its changes which makes most developers like you need that abstraction layer of somebody who manages the data and then someone who's his development but with cypher this it, it simplified to such a degree it's not just a minor simplification of the query it's like a major simplification of the query so much so that now uh, we use llms to write cypher queries and can yeah. do super complex stuff that we could never write SQL queries with that LLM because you can't give it the schema information. You can't feed it in such a way that it can get it right. But feeding it the cipher query knowledge is so much more simple. And and so this kinds of queries that we can do on the fly um, brings us to this new world where where databases don't always have to have these like highly structured cred, you know, um, you know, almost struck, uh, highly structured, you know, store procedure, like pre-written events, but you could, you can store things on the fly. You can create new tables. Essentially, it's not a table. Yeah. You can create new data types that, that it's, it, it's like we, at, we, we kind of go from cred to, 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 to creds with a plural, because it's like, we can create, we can read, we can update, we can delete, and we can now seek. We can go out there and just talk to people and seek, hey, what do you what equipment from the company are you using? And they could say, Oh, the company bought me a a whatever, an Android phone. And we can just suddenly add this to the database without saying, Hey, we need a new table or we need a new column called other in equipment and like it just gets added and it just exists and yep. and it's queryable now and and the query was written by an LLM and it's just like wow <laughs> it's nice isn't it when that happens because I, I you know obviously when we when we first built this stuff we yes. we hadn't realized that LLMs would be a thing one day right. whether you get to your database or have a co-pilot helping you to write code we we were actually thinking um, you know we the, the folks that invented Cypher so that's Andres Taylor. Uh, and uh, uh, 
Matthias back in back in the day were were kind of the people that originated those path patterns. And Andres in particular had come from a SQL background, and he shared he had kind of had frustrations about how unempathetic or inhumane SQL could be when you started to take it towards its limit. And he didn't want to do that. He didn't want end users to be worrying about implementation detail like outer join or inner join or left join because uh -huh. actually despite being a fan of databases if you quiz me on them now i would fail that exam right because that's complicated stuff i'd need a cheat sheet to help me through it and the idea that we had was like actually joins do exist in, in neo4j sort of certainly the folks that build the cipher query language sometimes they think about joins or, or relational algebra when they're thinking about how cipher works but as a user, I don't think of joins. And in the storage engine, we don't think of joins. And as a user, I think about arrows, their relationships, uh -huh. right? That's super easy to understand. You know, uh, Jim works at Neo4j. So easy, you, you know, an LLM can write that trivially. And in the storage engine for Neo4j, we don't think about joins there either, right? There's nothing joiny going on. It's just pointer traversal. So we're dereferencing pointers. And that's what gives us the performance because that's a really low overhead thing to do in modern computers, you know. Fetch a pointer from memory, de have a look what's in it, dereference it, go and fetch another pointer, rinse and repeat. And that's where you get enormous performance from. So you get this dual thing again where it's yeah. pleasant for humans or, you know, other human-like agents nowadays, I should say. Um, and it's fast to execute because it does what computers are good at, which is fetching pointers and then dereferencing them and fetching another pointer. Yeah. Yeah, when you look at, like, um, one of the challenges with data outside of the technology is just keeping data up up to date you know it's such an assumption we all make that once we have a database that somehow it's going to stay up to date but yet you go anywhere it's never completely up to date there's always something some problem with it and and that becomes like the bigger problem because a lot of times that's a human problem right yeah. it's having humans keep the data up to date and having interfaces to the data and and making sure that that over time, like, how do you know that some data just expires based on time alone? There's no event other than time that causes them to expire. You know, a person becomes an adult over time. And so they're a child until they're an adult. And, and that event doesn't, you know, doesn't naturally get triggered in most systems unless there's logic to trigger it. And someone has to build that logic. But in, in our world, we, we use graphs for uh, companies building like a digital twin of their company. So it's like they're like you said, their employees, the skills of those, like who knows Neo4j, the skills of those employees, the, the customers, the projects, what projects did they work on, the tickets, the, 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 the contractors, the, like every, every single item that happens and you go, well, the biggest problem with a digital twin or a map of your company, this like, version is keeping it up to date. You know, you can't hire a team to just constantly sit there observing every meeting, sitting in on every conversation and keeping some graph up to date. But with, with LLMs now, we can feed conversations to the LMM and extract using entity extraction and then keep that graph up to date just by observing, just creating a communication fabric and just observing observing the interactions that are happening and then keeping this digital twin up to date, which gives you this context machine now that's like unheard of that would allow people to interact with an LLM and a virtual assistant in such a way that it would know so much. It's like that person that's been at the company like you forever sitting beside you on your first day and you can ask all the questions. They can take you back in time and they're never going to get annoyed because you've asked too many questions, you know. Oh, and everyone gets one, you know? It's just it's just so fascinating. So fascinating. Yeah, I, don't, I love that interplay of LLM and knowledge graph. I really uh -huh. think that as a, a knowledge graph as an underlay for an LLM, kind of turn it into a domain-specific chatbot is so useful. So I, I was talking to some folks in Indonesia a, a, a few weeks ago. I, I had the privilege to be over in Jakarta uh, working with some some very graph-minded folks. And they love the idea of, of, of training their LLMs on their knowledge graph. So their customer uh -huh. service is very accurate. Look, their knowledge graphs aren't savants. They can't have yep. an arbitrary conversation with you. They can't, unfortunately, do your cipher. But they can give you amazingly accurate on you know, to, on the button yes. customer service. And I think this is really interesting. Is that a lot of the stuff that I see out there in the big world is like train your LLM on whatever you can find on the web and 
goodness only knows the web is a mixed bag, right? Of right. good information, bad information, contradictory information, and you know stuff that you can't legitimately be categorized as information because it's so yeah, stupid. Yeah, the whole alignment issue. Yeah, yeah. I think you know what, what if we if we trade on that general corpus, you get um, what I call the Boris Johnson problem. Now, you may have heard of Boris. Certainly, some of your British listeners will oh, have. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Boris Johnson is the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And he is extremely confident when he speaks. He's very knowledgeable. He's been trained very well. He went to some of the most amazing schools and universities in the world. So he's very well trained. So there's a, a kind of an analogy there. And he always speaks with confidence, except when he speaks, he also, in his mind, generates facts. He's a kind of generative AI in a way. And I, and I feel ball. for him in a way, right? Because a lot of people have accused him of falsehoods and so on. And he looks pained when people accuse him of falsehoods. And actually, objectively, some of the things he said are false. And you know, there's, a, there's a police thing going on and all that kind of stuff. But I believe that he doesn't believe that himself. He spontane spontaneously generated something that he genuinely believes is true and has communicated it confidently. And that's what we're seeing kind of with some of the more hilarious right. examples with yes. things like GPT, right? So... So um, Boris you know, Johnson my, my, my is hallucinating, team. sounds like. Boris Johnson <laughs> is hallucinating. Right? No, is. Boris yeah, Johnson is not generating. <laughs> quite a light, quite, quite light chat GPT, right? It's confidence on every, on practically everything you ask it, right. even if it's spouting actually untruth. So one of my colleagues, who's very cheeky, decided to ask chat GPT about the computer science breakthroughs that I'd done with another guy who's not a computer scientist. And we haven't worked together on things. Chat GPT wrote a beautiful essay a very plausible and believable essay on things that are absolutely every single line is untrue, but delivered with confidence and panache. So it's very believable, right? And I think for for some for some systems like, you know, kind of search engine or whatever, that will improve over time and blah, blah, blah. 90% of it will become good over time, just as Google became good. But in the enterprise, we can't have that. We can't have, you know, our machine learning tools imagining things like uh, imagining my bank balance based on some right. some rapids being fed or <laughs> triggering some action, you know, fire the missiles based on some hallucination no. it has. So I think there's an opportunity here to kind of bring uh, the kind of two halves together and start to um, help uh, LLMs to become smarter at, at smarter at a smaller number yeah. of things. And for me, that underlay, a good underlay for that is knowledge graphs, which I think yeah. is becoming particularly, it's like a, it's becoming kind of a macro trend in industry, right? Now everyone's talking about how do I arrange my knowledge purposefully so that I can understand yeah. it, so my systems can understand it, and imp increasingly importantly, so I can train good models that uh, that respond appropriately and don't go yeah. off on a, on a tangent all the time. Yeah, we yeah, spent a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, <laughs> you go. <laughs> all, right. all right, I'll go. So yeah, we spent a lot of time on this podcast talking uh, about how LLMs are like kind of these fantastic front ends that are in need of, of a back end and. GraphDB is seems like such an integral part of creating that back end that provides context so that these these models aren't hallucinating. And, it, and I wonder uh, yeah. if you could maybe talk a bit about the the how the relationship between GraphDB and kind of the technologies associated with AI have have evolved over the years. Yeah, I mean it's really interesting, right? Because you know, ten years ago, um, you know, AI wasn't the thing, so I was busy doing database stuff, and over. Over the last decade or so, the the AI winter finally unfroze, right? And then it feels like just you know three weeks ago the whole world exploded with AI, and you know I can I can talk to my parents and they're like, oh, do you know about Chat GPT now? And I'm, how do you know this? You're in your 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 old people, but it's it's absolutely everywhere. So I think I, I can I can plot our uh, path through this, and you know we we started off um, actually very kind of modestly. Um, we started to think about supervised algorithms back in the day. So these are broadly akin to the things that the computer scientists learned when they were at university, kind of pathfinding and community detection and label propagation, page rank, that kind of stuff. And that enables you to gather some insight into the general properties of a large graph, a large data set, right? So, I mean, of course, I think Google were phenomenally successful in writing that algorithm uh, to, to enormous success over the years. But then, then over time, you know, the kind of um, the the kind of ML pipelines came to 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 prominence. I'm thinking things like PyTorch and so on. And what we observed there is that in the kind of vanilla case, people would take their Oracle database and they would look at the columns that they have, and you know, they would select columns to become features, and then they train a model, right? And that I think is perfectly good, but it's not great, right? Because actually, uh -huh. those models, the, the original data model, 
it's kind of austere, right? I mean, we, we, we kind of kidded around a little bit earlier about the, the tyranny of tables and so on. But when you're, when you're trying to do ML, within reason, more features is better, right? You'll get a better, a better model out of it. And so we said, well, why not? Sure, take, you know, um, age and gender and zip code and that kind of stuff. That's cool. They're, they're, they're good features. But why wouldn't you also take the, the, uh, the page rank of, of, of your node? Why wouldn't you take the community that that node lives in? Why wouldn't you take the centrality score for that node? And all of these things are, are only available to you if you have a topology, if you have that kind of graph or network from which you can compute those numbers and send them off into your machine learning pipelines. And what we found there is, is that actually, again, within reason, using those graph features tends to make better models, models with more uh, predictive accuracy. Okay, so, so far, so good. We've been able to kind of augment your ML workflow. You're happy because you're working with graphs uh, at this end and your graph features are being used to create a predictive model that you can push to production that end. That, that's great. And then, you know, we're fans of graphs as well, right? But um, we also know that you can do learning on the graph. So then we turned our gaze slightly inward and we're like, well, what can we predict in the graph? And um, one of the best books I ever read on, on graph theory and game theory is called Networks, Crowds and Markets by Easley and Kleinberg. Um, which is a wonderful book. They were at Cornell at the time, I think. I, I suspect one or both of them are at Meta now doing kind of gra gra social graph analysis thing. But in that book, and it stuck with me for a long time, they drew a graph, a picture of the great houses of Europe in the late 1800s. And they drew lines between them, relationships between them, indicating who was a friend and who yeah, was an yeah. enemy. And they just used uh, a piece of graph theory called triadic closure, where you're trying to make triangles in the graph, which consist of either three friends, because that's quite a stable structure, or two friends and one enemy, another stable structure, because the two friends can gang up on the enemy. And they said, well, if we, if we let the graph resolve itself, let the tensions in that graph resolve, what actually happens is 1914. And in 1914, <laughs> it's very clear as that graph evolves, you get the, the, the effectively the great houses of Europe partitioned onto either side of a graph with only enemy relationships between them. And that's the starting condition for World War One, right? Which is, look, it's a phenomenal thing for graph theory to be able to predict. It's a horrible thing for the human race because that was a, obviously a terrible meat grinder. But the graphs have that predictive power. We start to look into that. It's like, okay, so we understand that we've got, you know, the, the techniques from graph theory that enables to get insights using the topology to kind of make, you know, to understand how the graph evolves. But why can't we generalize that? So now actually, for example, in Neo4j, you can tell the graph itself, hey, find me missing relationships. Oh, and when you're done with that, would you mind finding me missing labels from some of these nodes? Maybe the, the, you know, the data quality wasn't high and some things that should have been labeled account or person or home, maybe they haven't been labeled or they've been mislabeled. So can you find me those? And by the way, when you've done that, can you scan across the data and see if you think there are any missing properties in the data and what those values might be? So again, we can use the, the, the topological uh, context of the graph, topographical context of the graph, and sorry, the topological context of the graph, and we can use that to start to infer new values like within the graph itself. And look, I'm not I'm not a smart data scientist or a smart ML person, but even I can do that because it's a single procedure call. Like graph, learn this for me. But of course, that again is not where it stops. So I think where we are now, you can't you can't say AI without someone telling you about Gen AI which is, uh, sorry, uh -huh. that's, that's an Americanism that I, I despise. <laughs> me. Uh, I, it seems to be oversimplified to with an inch of its existence. But you know, yeah. people, you know, we, we, today you think, okay, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do LLMs. I think there's very clearly two, two uh, emerging use cases, kind of opposite use cases with graphs and LLM. Uh, one is, as, I, as we talked about earlier, uh, you've, got, uh, you've got an LLM that you train on a graph, and that LLM, LLM becomes... Uh, a kind of a chatbot that's very domain specific, gives accurate answers because it's what it's it's been it's been trained on highly typically uh, human or part human, part, part algorithmically curated mm -hmm. data, but good quality data, right? And that's good. The other thing that I really like is the flip of that. So there are some bioinformaticians, uh, so uh, some folks uh, working in pharma, and they've created a system called BioCipher. Uh, what they do is they use the LLM to suck in a huge corpus of medical data. Right. But of course, they don't trust the LLM to answer because the LLM can sometimes be a bit creative. So yeah. they then from that effectively distill a knowledge graph from the LLM, which can be inspected and reasoned about by humans. So when they say it's this drug acting on this gene or whatever medical people say, uh -huh. uh, when they go to the regulator, the regulator says, well, why? They say, well, actually, because this part of the graph tells us that. 
which is really hard to do with an LLM because it, you can't reason about it. It's not, it's opaque to reasoning. So I see, yeah. I see those two things as like, you know, table stakes right now are you know, either using the LLM to create a graph or training the LLM on a yeah. graph. Where it goes from here, well, I, I don't know, right? Because it feels like we're at the beginning of something extremely exciting. But All I right, can't. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out there. When we wrote the book, um, we uh, predicted the LLMs like years before. Um, uh, and it's not because we we're some sort of futurist or savant or anything. It's just because we were working in it, you know, and we yeah. could see. We could see what was what was coming. We knew where this was going. So I'm gonna officially make another prediction that the next big leap, the next chat GPT leap is not gonna be a better LLM with more, you know, more data or or specific LLMs joined together that the next like end user noticeable leap is going to be a convergence between graph and LLMs and and I'll back it up. I'm not just going to say it. I'll back it up right now with uh, way back when uh, my team uh, participated in the design of the 787 Dreamliner cockpit. And and the goal was to automate this airplane, everything about it, right? So, so in 10 minutes, I'd never flown an airplane in my life. I was trained in 10 minutes. I took took off and landed the 787, um, could have never done the 747, no way, right? Now, could I have taken over manually if something happened? Absolutely not. That by no means made me a pilot, but it shows how incredible it was. And one of the things that was key to that project was that it was a carbon fiber frame. We had bigger windows and less wall space and more automation and the need for more buttons. So they're like, we have less walls and we need more buttons. And so now if you look at the 787, it's like six iPad windows, right? And the two on the flanking side are actually the flight planning, right? And now what we have is these windows that pop up the right buttons depending on where in the flight plan you are, right? And based on that flight plan, we can predict the buttons you're going to need. And that's what made this so simple because now you're not looking at a thousand buttons to figure out what button to press next, but it's it's popping up. So when you look at it, it's a prediction machine, right? Just like you're talking about. We're, we had a flight plan. So from that data, we could predict the next things you were going to need. So the future of LLMs isn't understanding people better. It's predicting what people want before they want it. That's the ultimate experience that we want is predicting accurately what we want. So we don't even have to be asked what we want. And I think graphs are the solution to that. They're the context machine that's necessary to exist outside of the LLM that makes the LLM highly personalized, highly, highly predictive for us. So I think the next leap is, you know, a graph with LLMs. And that's that's where we're going to see like mind blowing changes again uh, in a convergence, not just. The exp although LLMs will get better, I'm not saying they're not going to get better. And but but that big like wow, next wow moment, I think comes from graphs and graphs and and LLMs. So there, I put it well, out there. <laughs> I, I, I have to ask. I know I know the flow is meant to be the other way, right? But I have to ask. So um, so on the on the 787 example, I mean, how how do you do fault tolerance there, right? What if your LLM starts or your predictive mechanism gives you the wrong? Do you have like triple modular redundancy or something there to ensure Yeah, of course. Yeah, if the button's not there, of course there's a way to get to it, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Now, we didn't have LLMs. We didn't have natural language, so it's not part of it at all. The point was if we had it, it would have made it better because LLM, language was the fallback to prediction. If I couldn't predict what you wanted next, I could ask you. But that was a fallback position um, this actually happened. We were talking uh, uh, to Adam Scher, um in recently on the podcast, and I was talking to him um, separately when Steve Jobs actually bought Siri. And his ultimate vision was that the phone would know what you wanted to do before you wanted that, that one button. The goal was that that one button was language and that the phone would predict what you wanted to do before you did it. But if it failed, you would press that button and 
and it could ask you like, hey, a question to get that context so it could predict better, right? So this was this was a vision he had for the iOS of the phone uh, a long time ago. It's just the language capabilities stymied progress and they had to roll it back to something much, much simpler. Um, so I, again, I'm backing this up. This isn't, this isn't what I think, you know, this is, I think this is what he thought. This is what a lot of people think. Um, but I'm going to say that I think graph as a data storage system is the, it's as if it was designed just for context for this purpose. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we often say that, right? Graph gives yeah. you context or you know, data in context. Is, uh, fact, it, was, it was a tagline of a book I wrote not long ago. It was data in context. But I, I was, um, on that note, I, 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 I find that very plausible. I was with a, an old friend of mine, Ajay Gure from Sequoia, um, a few weeks ago in Singapore. And, you know, we were having a couple of beers in the lovely warm sunshine and discussing nerd stuff. And we, we bumbled into exactly this topic this idea of having small personalized models that would understand your context, underlaying that with a knowledge graph, uh, coincidentally having to have, you're having like, what is it, 20 odd cores of unused machine learning power in my laptop nearby, which my phone, of course, can happily talk to. And we right. started to wonder what, what, would, what would this be used for, right? And we, we kind of reached, at least in a kind of slightly beery fashion, the conclusion that this would be an amazing thing that would make Siri look like an infant. Right, because yes, it would have yes. context, and it would be able to you know, incrementally compute with your current context, your current personal knowledge graph, the actual state of things you wanted to be. It should have been able to compute that I was slightly tipsy and should stop drinking and should get a cab home. That wasn't uh -huh. what I did because without that technology, I was slightly tipsy and I went and found the hottest curry I could find, which I regretted the day after. Right, so we need this kind of you know, safety critical system in this case. Yeah, I, I um, would call it a source of truth. Right, we need a source yeah. of truth behind this hallucination that it can double check with. Right, it can say, "Hey, my company laptop is broken," and it can say, "You don't have a company laptop." Oh, absolutely. Right. <laughs> Whereas an LLM will say, "Great, I can help you with that." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you want another one? Yeah, do you want another one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I, I. So anyway, I put it out there. I, I, I think graphs. I think convergence is where this happens next. The, the LLMs will progress, but convergence yeah. is, is, is what's next on the docket for. Well, like, look, I hope you're breakers. right. I think graphs are are a great underlay for this, and um, I, I, you know, I'm, I am desperate for more people to just to see the utility of graphs. And if that's, if that's the way people come to graphs then so be it, because I think that was going to give them an amazing yeah. experience. If that was their first touch, it's just going to blow them away. Because I think yeah. my first touch was much more low-level and nerdy than that, and you have to kind of imagine the possibilities, but being presented with the possibilities in a way that is your real life is so compelling. Yeah, yeah. Well, it seems like in terms, too, of, of enterprises looking to create digital twins, I mean, the GraphDB part of it is just enormous, because... Because I mean, so many, so many of us individually and as companies, just been collecting ungodly amounts of data for years and years. But but it kind of is being used in these myopic ways. And yeah. it seems like if you're really trying to open up your organization, that's kind of the biggest piece of what you're trying to do. I, I, I'm with you on that. In fact, um, an un, unsubtle plug. Sorry, lads, but um, me and Jesus Barasa, we just finished a book for O'Reilly called Building Knowledge Graphs, which. Ebooks available oh, today. Everyone grab a copy. Congratulations! Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It was, a, it was a really lovely book. Jesus is an amazing co-author, so kudos to him more, more than me. But but in there, we actually do tackle some of this idea of enterprise digital twin, and we we came at it from actually from a, an NHR point of view, not from a kind of you know uh, rules and regulations point of view, but from a skills point of view, because it turns out that large businesses they really they can understand that they've got a factory or an office, but they really don't understand the assets that their humans have very well. And they don't, definitely don't understand the assets of their humans in aggregate, or indeed the myriad of interactions those humans have that can make them stronger or weaker over time. And so we we, we decided, um, actually influenced by by DXC Technology, one of the big consulting companies who'd built such a system, we we kind of dug down there and we found that you know we could build a graph of your your career, it's simple things if you like, the projects you uh -huh. worked on and. You know, and the technologies that were connected to those projects and your duration on the exposure on those projects and the people you'd worked with and so on. And from that, we were able to not only recommend to you next good projects that you'd want to work on, perhaps with people you work well with uh, or, or avoid people that you didn't work well with based on your skills and experience, 
but also start to recommend to you based on, hey, look, you've been doing Java for a while, but everyone else that did Java has now peeled off into Python and machine learning and start to help people from their own data in the context of the rest of the business have this curated learning path so that they could uh, sound relevant. I think those patterns are broadly applicable. I mean, we, we focused on a kind of narrow view of the, of the enterprise, the skills part of it, skills and people part, but broadening that out to a kind of general enterprise digital twin is it, possible nowadays. And I think with, and, uh, and with LLM technology on the front end, trained on that graph, again, you have that, as we said earlier on, you've got that friend on day one who can yeah. start to advise you on what to do next and never gets tired of you. And perhaps right. sometimes you know, misunderstand you because computers are fallible, but yeah. you know, it's that, it's that thing that you need to navigate a large enterprise and be able to make an impact as an individual. Yeah. I'm also super interested in this idea of putting knowledge in like knowledge in the graph as well, not just things, you know, not just people, yeah. not just these nodes, but knowledge itself and saying, you know, this not, and it's not just about like the source of truth concept. Like it's not just about training your LLM on a bunch of knowledge that's related to your company, but it's, but what happens when that knowledge contradicts itself? What happens when you're feeding it um, knowledge from different dates that were printed at different times and the LLM doesn't have the ability to understand yeah. that one, one piece of knowledge is older than another and therefore outdated. And unless you curate that stuff, you're gonna run into all these problems, but by having knowledge in a graph and 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 using like you know human in the loop to kind of keep that knowledge current you can gain a source of truth for those critical things like you said yeah. like how many vacation days do i have um and it being accurate instead of you know I, I always use the example of if you fed it data on conversations from uh from customer service calls um in california and then you said what's the weather it would be sunny and nice <laughs> right always always right it wouldn't it could be a storm outside that you could be in a hurricane right but it would it would always be sunny and nice yeah. um and so you need this this source of truth for us to take this next level we need something that can store truth even if that truth to your point isn't 100 percent accurate it's going to be far far but it's going to be accurate enough right to make uh, to make a stratus change in how we operate with software um so yeah really oh. man i'm just obviously a huge fan of you guys <laughs> for coming up with it but also just of where we're going <laughs> i mean look it's i think this is a really important point you you say that we want to store the truth the truth is a complicated thing right what my yeah, what is the truth, the right? truth <laughs> is certainly not the truth that i know that and certainly right. this isn't the absolute truth either right but I think graphs are fine because they're, 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 the structure is amenable to that. And then at query time, you can choose what level of truth you want. You, know, you can uh -huh. choose to put boundaries on on facts that you learn from the graph and say, well, that's too old, so I'm not sure about it. Or right, actually, that's surrounded by yeah. a bunch of other facts that support it. So I'm quite keen on that. I, I believe that to be probably true. So I think you get that advantage again from the topology, which gives you that leg up when it comes to having that truth. I will, however, say something you know, slightly negative about graphs, right? So you, you're right, you, you do have to curate that and sometimes there's human in the loop, right? And so there's not a free lunch, you still have to care about the quality of your data. But what I will say is that in graphs, that human in the loop has tools to amplify, right? So we have the suite of, you know, graph algorithms written mm -hmm. by people with complicated Dutch surnames that can help us to kind of you know, curate the graph at scale because there's no way you or I could manually curate even a no way. even you know, I mean, of a Google sized company we can't do yeah. that ourselves but with the assistance of algorithms a human can be a reasonable curator of even very large knowledge graphs but you still have to care about the quality of your data right there's no you know graph doesn't equal good quality no. data necessarily you still put the effort in yeah it just represents a a a, a place to store truth but it doesn't it doesn't know the truth uh, nor absolutely. does an LLM. It, it can't can tell you whether it's truth or not. It, it's just by its sheer existence and some algorithm, we can we can add a confidence score to to how confident uh, it is of truth based on an algorithm, but it can't know on its own, which is, I think that's what makes it valuable though. Like you don't want it to. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you're just repeating the same problem. You're not, you're not solving a problem. You're, you're just, you're just replicating the same problem in LLMs. 
Um, I, I, I like what you said. I, I want, because I see it as like a, a, a kind of a, a, a loop, right? It's, it's great for getting data. It's great for accessing data. It's great for storing data, but it's great for formatting data for ML because it's almost perfectly curated. If you, if you did the first part right, right, and that's valuable, you automatically, as a free lunch, you get data perfectly organized and ready for ML. Yeah. And that's yeah, we, huge we have to, to like ML, like hiring, you know, massive teams of people to curate data. I, I, even the the whole alignment thing of like reinforced learning afterwards, because you fed it so much crap, you got to untrain it. Like, what about just giving it the right data in the first place? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but. No, no, not at all. I mean, I saw an example of this just a few weeks ago, which really bothered me because again, it was the technology getting in the way. In this case, it was a relational schema where it had person, you know, let's say owns car, perfectly reasonable thing to express in relational, but we also had person owns dog. And that's clumsy yeah. in relational, right? Whereas in graph, you just say, Jim owns car, Jim owns dog. And that owns relationship, it's not picky about what it connects. So you can freely mix it in with, you know, owners and owned, owned things, dogs, printers, screens, houses, cars, whatever, without the data stuff getting in the way. And it was so annoying when we had that relational schema and we realized, actually, I now have to go, I have to say like person owns house, house, and then separately right. person owns pet, pet. Right. And then the way that that ultimately f filters down to the ML pipeline is clunky and horrible. Uh, right. uh, oh my word, like, why are we making our lives so much harder? Yeah, and, and you go like person owns car, like person owns primary car, second car, collector car, RV, yeah, like, yeah. And, and now this stuff, you're not adding all these fields to a table somewhere going, cause, because there's a waiting system on relationships. It's not just on off switches. We have close friend, we have, you know, we have the, like to be able to add waiting to these relationships, it just unlocks so much more information about like yeah. a relationship isn't Boolean. It's not on or off. It's, it's weighted and that waiting changes over time. So it, being able to factor in the, the weight of a relationship would change how an LM would talk to you. It might say, yeah. oh, that's your good friend. It's their birthday. You better send them a card versus it's your acquaintance. Like you might want to send them a card. I can go ahead and send it for you. They won't know it didn't come from you. <laughs> Absolutely. And making that a non-event is surprisingly important. If you think uh -huh. about how you do that in relation, it's like, oh, wait a minute. I've got oh to add God. another column to my join table now or... Oh boy! And I gotta call my data thing. team. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And some some grumpy some grumpy DBA is gonna explain to you patiently why that definitely can't be done in the next three months. Right. And for, for good reason, but you know, it's it's an implacable foe almost in your mm. own enterprise because the technology causes that kind of confrontation. And in a graph, that's that's a non-event. I add it; it doesn't affect you guys. And so everyone lives in harmony because you only care about the data you care about. There's a kind of consumer-oriented view of that, which is far more flexible and happy than the kind of one-size-fits-all view that we have to, to suffer if we, if we live under the yeah. relational world. Yeah, I'm going to bore people for a second here and, and, and just ask you a total nerd question. Um, but as you, as you try to create these cipher queries with LLMs and you're and and you you still need a structure for node types, right? Like a person has to be a person. And if you start changing and mixing, you could lose the connectivity, right? Synonyms of person, people. Um, yeah. What's the best way in graph to handle fuzzy match on node? Yeah. Node so no, in so the, there are some in Nifj, there are some kind of basic features for this. So for individual properties and so on you can use things like regular expressions ruby ruby style regular expressions to start to ma match some of the fuzziness there that that's okay right but that's it doesn't nice. it doesn't light my world on fire i think what's actually much more interesting for us is the forthcoming iso excuse me iso gql standard so this is the same committee that standardized sql back in the day and now standardizing gql to graph query language 
And one of the really interesting things I think is coming as part of that standard is this idea of fuzzy path matching. I think that does set my world on fire, right? Because right. fuzzy ma you know, matching approximately on your name, good, yeah. but everyone can do that. Like I said, it's Ruby right. derived regex here. But being able to do a fuzzy match on a path, right? Uh -huh. That is so much more interesting because yeah. it's the connection. That's transference. The path the yeah. yeah, absolutely, right? It's so much more. Transfer learning. You, yeah. I mean, yep. You need to see my demeanor, right? I'm like, yeah, regular expression, whatever. <laughs> I, write, I, write, I write a, re a regex to solve one problem. Now I've got yeah. 99 more problems, right? But, but the idea of saying, look, I could approximately describe a path, find map things that approximately match this. Both, both for performance or indeed for, for broadening the, the net of things that you want to bring in is going to be really powerful, I think. That's exciting. Yeah, I, I think that's one of those unlocking things as well for just maintaining your digital twin uh, automatically without having to curate it. And yeah. I mean, you can yeah. still have human in the loop as a, as a pathway to make confirmations, but it's more like just confirming with people. They're not, they're not like their job won't be to manage the database it'll just be like hey i just want to double check this with you yeah. it could be while you're grabbing a coffee it does boom adds it to the graph and off you go we have a source of truth that was pretty effortless and and not centralized and that's kind of where i wanted to go next what are your what are your thoughts on decentralized graphs and like blockchain you know oh boy I, I have very little expertise in blockchain and all, all I have are uneducated opinions like it's environmentally destructive way of criminals shifting money around, at least in the kind of crypto space. Um, right. In terms of blockchain itself, I, I only really know it from a systems point of view. And those of us in database world, we look at the blockchains and say, wow, those are the lowest transaction per second databases you can possibly imagine. Right. Um, so, um, <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know too much. What, what I do know is when people are looking at operations on the blockchain, that itself forms a graph. And I think what's right. interesting for me is not the blockchain technology itself. That's not part of my no. sort of systems interest, but I am interested when people, particularly for financial transactions on, on uh, things like uh, Bitcoin and so on, just watching where people surface through the exchanges, kind of dipping into the real world, then being able to connect those together. I think, again, a, a kind of knowledge graph structure, interrogatable perhaps, uh, uh -huh. by an LLM, uh, is really interesting. You know, hey, tell me about tell me about transfers in and out of Russia that go via a friendly second country. That kind of stuff would be very right. interesting in these current times. What about a decentralized graph? Forget the blockchain, just you know. the idea that, because graphs work so well together, like you said, there's, they sort of join naturally in, in in, it's it's like another one of those free lunches you sort of get, right? Um, yeah. Instead of having a graph, having like multiple graphs that can like join dynamically with each other. Yeah. So so I, I think that I mean I, I have to say that's a good idea because that's one of the things that Neo4j does today. So in Neo4j you have multiple disjoint graphs that you know each serves a particular business need. I don't know, one's your sales graph and one's your product catalog graph or whatever. And then at runtime, you can choose to effectively join, join in lowercase j, join, right. bring together uh, those graphs because you want to be able to, you know, security permissions affording, of course, you want to be able to interrogate uh, the data housed in both. So I think that's a perfectly reasonable idea. I'd like the way that you can get separation of concerns. So again, uh -huh. in my day job where I'm doing accounting or whatever, I don't trouble you in your day job doing product management. But when someone wants to understand you kind yeah, of, you like know, the sales of the product together. over time. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> then they can, then they can effectively do a union on on some relevant subgraphs and see yeah. what happens. So it seems I like this is where the ISO standard unlocks it. Like, because now we have a, a node matching and a fuzzy matching on the nodes. Because I might call my node one thing, you might call your node another, yeah. and to know that that those are those should be you know synonyms or equal. Um, I think that's one way of doing it. The the kind of uh, traditional way there would be to have a taxonomy or perhaps even an ontology that acts yeah, as, a, yeah. as a bridge between them. So in in my graph, I would say that, you know, I, I, I call this a line item and I have uh -huh. a link to something called like product in an ontology. And you and I both agree on that ontology and you call your things, I don't know, prods and you have a uh -huh. link to product in the ontology and then we can reason about it, right? Because we say, oh, these are both instances of the same thing right so there, there right. is some heritage there again from in this case from the semantic web world that's that's come forward into the modern graph world and we can leverage yeah. that kind of uh, inferencing as well yeah you can do it but the exciting thing is like being able to 
join these dynamically. Like I you got a graph, I, I got a graph. Let's put them together Excel. and start asking yeah. questions. You know, that's the mind melt is like it's Spock, it's Star Trek. Like let's do a mind melt on our graphs here. <laughs> I, I think that with, with the with GQL coming, I think the, the standard is is due out this year. I think that kind of stuff's going to become a reality in technology pretty soon. Like wow, just yeah. oh man, I love being alive today. This is so exciting. Uh, I'm, I'm so. I feel so lucky we 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 get to work in this stuff. Uh, I know, right? Um, we're, like, we're like living in the future. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's um, a real treat. This was a, yeah, it, this it, was a great talk. I didn't let Josh talk at all. I was so excited about this. <laughs> I just, I pretty much cut him off at every pass. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Josh. You guys can set up a separate call. <laughs> he has a ton of questions that he wanted to ask. I just couldn't help. Myself here, I just uh, was dying I, I to have this conversation. I know how excited you were, Rob, so I was happy to, uh, <laughs> to see you run free there. <laughs> hey, well, great, well, great chat today. Thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for, uh, for thanks for hosting me. It's, uh, yeah, it's been, yeah, I can, I'm, I'm very happy. It's a lovely chat. Thank you. Uh, awesome. Absolutely. Thanks again. Thanks again for joining us here on Invisible Machines. Subscribe to Invisible Machines wherever you get your podcasts. We have new episodes dropping each week throughout season two. We have a lot more great guests in store for you. We also have some surprises that we're working on. So stay tuned. You can watch this podcast at the Invisible Machines YouTube channel. Thank you, as always, to the team at UX Magazine for making this podcast possible. Uh, and that includes Kate Timchenko, who books all these wonderful guests and does so many other things behind the scenes, as does Elias Parker. Thank you to the marketing team at OneReach AI, particularly Mike Litvinov, our video editor, who makes this podcast look and sound amazing. Next week, speaking of amazing, we have Laura Herman on the show. She is a senior research lead at Adobe, and this was a really, really cool conversation. I don't think Rob and I were expecting such a broad and deep discussion of creativity and art, what it means to, to create art, to be an artist, to see art, to experience art, and how AI fits in to all of that. It is a great episode, and I can't wait to share it with you next week right here on Invisible Machines. 